Centered Design. Uh, and this is a term that is also used, and basically you can think of this as being equivalent to user centered design to the point that the International Standards Organization standard it uses the term user centered human centered design in its definition to describe user centered design. So you know, some could argue about this, but my my argument would be that these are equivalent, these are equivalent terms. There is also a related term called design thinking, which is sort of a different spin on the same method. Um, design thinking tends to be used a little more broadly. Um, it's a very popular term in business right now, but this is, and it has been popularized by the, uh, the D school, the design school at Stanford, and they use very similar methods to what I'm going to be talking about, um, but they use, a, they use a, a term called design thinking. B sometimes does systematic reviews. I really like using the original term so that we don't confuse people. Um, so I tend to use the original user-centered design. But I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of key points about this. And the first one is that this is a cycle. And that is really, really critical. And it's one of the reasons that I tend to use this framework, and I've, I've thought about it this way, rather than using the design thinking, um, which is technically, they do say, you know, go back and loop through, but they don't explicitly make it visually a cycle. And that's, that's something that I really want to emphasize with this. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, well, how many cycles and what is a cycle and all that. But the key point, the first point that is critical about this is that this, is, this process is a cycle. You go around and around, and that is how it works. Key point is that when we talk about the user, we don't just talk about needs. Um, a lot of times in healthcare, we will start with a needs assessment. When we, when we use user-centered design, we look at more than need. Um, often when people do needs assessments, they're actually looking, they do end up looking at more than needs. Um, but this, this is very explicit in this framework. The third point is that we start looking at prototypes, which are basically just early versions of the, whatever it is that we're developing, be it, an, be it a website, an intervention, you know, a training program, whatever it happens to be, we get rough versions really early. Um, <clears throat> and sort of a, a statement here, it's, it's never too early to start testing your designs. As soon as you have a concept, a sketch, you're testing it with people as soon as possible. The key point is that when it's how we test it, we show it to people and ask them the, what they think. Okay. And this is the this is a really key difference between you know getting a focus group together, and showing them something, and asking them their opinion. That is a really good thing to do. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But this isn't what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is observing how people interact with it, um, and that thing can be more meaningful than asking. You can get different types of data and more meaningful data when you watch how people use something. Thing. This is a quote by Henry Ford that I really like. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And this is where sometimes when you're observing, you can get different kinds of data and different ideas than you would get if you asked people things. Um, this isn't to say that we shouldn't ask people, but I'm just I, I just want to really highlight the point that you get different you get different data and different insights when you serve than when you ask. Everyone who is familiar with KT is familiar with the, with the cycle on the left, the knowledge to action cycle. And so I just wanted to make a quick comparison between these two just to give everyone a really clear sense of how these fit together or don't. And so both of these are cycles. And that's one of the things we have in common. Um, but the cycles are, you can think of these cycles very differently. So the knowledge to action cycle, often one cycle is a big thing, and it's one or more research projects, and you do the full context, all the way from problem definition through implementation and monitoring. Whereas the cycles within user-centered design are fast. You want multiple cycles per research project, 
and you may or may not include implementation within your cycle. Um, if it's something that you observe, then it becomes included, but in the user-centered design part of something is just the design and development part. This is just a portion of a larger, when you think about using, if you, if you are considering using this within a KT project, user-centered design would be the design and development part, but it would inform other parts, but it does not, it, that framework does not include the whole process of knowledge to action includes. So for those who go down this road or, or who are considering down this road, one of the questions that often gets asked is where do you start? Um, because this framework, because the way that we've really depicted this is a cycle that just keeps going, going, and going. Um, on purpose because you technically can start anywhere. However, I will say commonly, if you're not sure where to start, often where you want to start is by in somewhere in the understanding your user phase. Um, usually you do this by user research and one of the really powerful ways you can do that is by observing existing practices. And I would recommend this um, if possible, particularly when you want to understand the context in which you you would be designing and potentially implementing something. Um, I've listed a couple of papers here. So the first is from um, the group at Mayo Clinic by Victor Montori. And in the mid-2000s, they had a, a designer by the name of Maggie Breslin working with them, who is just brilliant. And they, this, this paper that's cited here, here describes the process of developing um, cards that they are now using to help people with diabetes make type diabetes make decisions about their treatment. And it started very much with a designer sitting in the room watching what happens in the clinic in those consultations. And through that process of observing existing practices, they can see what are we doing naturally now. Where are the gaps? What are the things that need to be addressed? Um, but you can't always you can't always get that information through interviews and focus groups and on. Even though again, those are good things to do. Another good example that um, that was recently that was that came out recently, and I'm sorry, I think that's a typo on my part. That was 2015 that this paper came out. But describing um, one of the things that these authors described in this paper was of how they sent their whole team programmers, researchers, everyone to assisted living facilities to spend significant amounts of time with adults and observe their life and the challenges that they face and so on, and how that gave them a much deeper understanding of who their users were, what context was, what barriers and what barriers that they, they faced, and what their needs and goals might be. So this is one of the processes by which we increase knowledge that allows us to better understand our users. The methods that, that are used more broadly in addition to this, to this um, recommended, recommended step of observing, observing existing practices, sometimes some, some frameworks refer to understanding users as empathy. This is that is often used in design thinking. Um, different people have different feelings about this. I, I don't really have strong opinions about whether we're understanding users or empathizing with, with to me, that it's part and parcel of the same thing. Um, but it happens via user research. And what we're looking for is who is my user? Who are my users? What are their needs and goals? What are strengths and their limitations? And I think it's really important important to look at both of these. Um, often people will look at limitations, but they forget to look at strengths. What is context? So, for example, if we're looking at clinicians, what is the workflow they're typically working with? And their intuitive processes, what do they do naturally? How do they currently address this issue? Um, because unless it's a brand new problem that's going to be hitting them, and it's pretty unusual, Typically, this is something that they already deal with in some way. So typically used for user research to understand your users. Under users, 
um, you know, are, are pretty standard stuff um, at the top of the list here. You know, we can look to the literature often, particularly in health services research. It's really nice. We do a lot of a lot of studies of people and what are their contacts and all that sort of stuff. So there there tends to be more literature in health than there is necessarily other fields in which user-centered design might be used. Use focus group surveys. These are all things that people do to understand what the people are trying to do, what are their needs, what are their goals, what are their strengths and limitations. And then there are some other some other techniques. Um, one is called card sorting, which is basically where you give literally you give people stacks of cards and ask them to sort them in terms of what's most important to what's least important, or to group them to the things that go together. Um, some people do diary or camera studies where they ask people to document their own process. Sometimes you might do observation and sharing, which is where you sort of glue someone next to them to, to do that process of documentation. Um, during these depends a lot on your problem and context. So I can't I can't say, oh, this is what you should do, because it really depends on the problem that you're addressing. But this is a list of some of the things that you might do. And at the end here, I, I, I'm giving, I've got a list of recommended resources where you can go to get more information about each of these. Your good user research is to carry something into the process of prototyping. And typically what you want to carry in are their personas or uses, tasks, and scenarios. So in this case, tasks and scenarios, those are easier, typically easier for people in health to get in the sense that when I say, you know, you have to describe what it is that the person needs to do, most people get that pretty well. Personas are a little bit newer to a lot of people, so I'm just going to describe that briefly. Develop a persona. The goal is to represent a type or a group of users. So we've done this user research, and then we want to say, okay, well, what does this user research tell us about the people for whom we are designing this? And the idea is to come up with archetypes, not stereotypes. Often, what will happen is, and the classic classic way of using a persona is, you know, you have a you have a research team, a design team around the table, and you have poster boards or big sheets of paper, or possibly you might have a binder, or you might have, but you have some physical artifact representing each of your personas, and you will have a photo of a real person, you will have a description, a name, typically it's, you know, a photo of, you know, some stock photo of someone, and then you'll assign a name and a description of that person. There was a really nice paper in Knowledge Translation that came out about this um, by the team that that's run the tapestry study, where what they did is they had, as part of their user research, their research, they got together focus groups of potential users and had them construct personas. The thing with personas is it gives you a really concrete example. So when you're later working through design questions and so on, you've got maybe three or five personas, and when the design team is discussing how should we address this, and someone comes up with an idea, and then we say, okay, well, how would our how would our persona Marie how would Marie deal with that? And it's it's a really it's a really powerful way to avoid going spinning off into well, people might do this and people might do that. You 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 specify who are the people for whom you are designing through the personas, and that allows you to actually make progress in the design process. One of your user research, and you have an idea of whom, for whom you are designing, then at the stage of developing and refining prototypes. A type is just a version. Right? So, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's a name that may not be used necessarily in, in a lot of health services research, but everyone is familiar with, you know, you've got a rough version, you've got a pilot version, you've got a final version. Those are prototypes. So a prototype is a mock-up. An example. So, as I said earlier, my research is all about interactive interfaces. So, my mock-ups tend to be visual, and I start with sketches. And these are real sketches that I used in a real study. 
you know, I used these sketches to get the grant, and then I ran a study, and these were the sketches that I used when I started bringing people in. I did seven rounds of seven cycles of design. I showed people these sketches, and I taught them, and I asked them what they would do and where they would push and what they thought about them and how they would use them. And so these are the types of sketches that are rough. They intended to get initial feedback on the concept. Um, one of the advantages of starting with rough prototypes is they tend to get more constructive feedback about about big picture, and you get, oh, well, I don't really like that, that color, and you know, I don't like that logo. Those kinds of things can be saved for later. If you start with rougher with rougher concepts, you tend to get more constructive feedback. This is sort of, these are these are examples of how prototypes start, and they start to they get a little a little more clean. They they cleaner. You start to have functional prototypes. So this is where, this these are steps along how this this particular project went um, through seven stages of design. So this idea of of how this works and. The prototyping methods will really, really depend on what you're designing, and so I'm not going to talk about, you know, different software that you can use because people who do knowledge translation research do a lot of different kinds of stuff. Um, but I will just give you an example from web and mobile applications. So you'll typically start with things like storyboards and sketches. Storyboards are like a cartoon, like a cartoon of what you want to have happen, and then you turn that into sketches. You get up to wireframes where you start to draw the relationships between different parts of an application. You get to semi-functional prototypes where some things work and some things don't, and functional prototypes. And what we're doing here is we're moving further and further along in terms of what we call fidelity. How close is it to the final version that we want? And the reason that we start rough and move forward is that it's expensive. It's expensive to program whole native, native mobile app. And it's so much more efficient to get feedback with a with a rough version and a rough sketch before you, you pump out of the grant money into preming something that you have to completely change. One that is often used in user-centered design that I think is particularly useful for for field of KT is a participatory design workshop. So this is often a half day to a full day where you gather a diverse group of people. So you, you get your whole team together, including a lot of users, and you do a bunch of rapid cycles. Um, there are a lot of different tools that you can, a lot of different ways that you can approach a, a workshop. But typically what you will do is you bring together a lot of people. Um, you, ideally, you already have some solid user research so you have some idea of where you're, um, for whom you're designing, and you give people materials for prototyping. So often this is, you know, a lot of different kinds of paper and things they can draw with and, and sticky notes. This is not to be super high tech, um, but you do need to allow people space and time and material to be creative. And looking to carry into the observation stage are prototypes. And that's this next phase, which is observing. This is it I read fairly recently that I really, really like. Design like you're right and listen like you're wrong. And what it means is you have to have ideas. You have to, you have to think your ideas are going to work. And you have to be totally prepared for your ideas are totally wrong and you have to change them. And this is why starting with just rough sketches is really useful because you haven't invested a lot of time and money into that yet. Another thing in user-centered design is fail early and fail well. By fail early, what, what I mean is you, sh you get feedback as early as possible, and fail well means you learn from that feedback, and you use that feedback to improve your design. So the concept with user testing is you want to see how people respond. Okay? It isn't that you want to see what they think. Opinions matter, but it's not just their opinions. You also want to see how they react. You use those data to fix problems and adjust your design accordingly. And again, 
The reason that this is a powerful method is because it's an efficient way to discover problems before launching an expensive pilot study or trial. I lab and field user testing. So lab means the people come to you. Field means you go to them. Uh, again, you can start with low fidelity. There's some older, we don't really have good current evidence, but older evidence suggests that fidelity makes no difference. Um, and you want to give people some tasks. So you want to come in with a specific task outline. So for example, in some of my studies, it might be, so now imagine that you are, you know, you have been diagnosed with X disease and you have to make Y decision. And here is the, you know, here's a sketch of, of a website that we're giving you and what would you click on first? a lot of different user testing methods and I really don't have time to go through to go through them even before I completely missed the timing of this, of this meeting. Um, but the main method that is used is called ThinkLoud and most people have had some exposure to this. This is used fairly frequently. Um, what you do is you just get people to articulate what they are thinking as they're interacting with something. And you can do it during. So you have them you can show people something, have them talk through, okay, I'm reading this and I'm wondering what that means and I'm thinking to myself, how does that fit with da 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 da, da. So as to articulate what they are thinking, how they are reacting as it's happening, or you can record an interaction and then go through it with them afterwards and ask them to articulate what they were thinking at the time. Both of these methods have pros and cons. If you go do user testing, a couple of useful tricks that I will give you at some point in every single user testing session, people will look to the research research associate, research assistant, researcher who is there and look to them for what do I do next? And the question you feed back to them is, well, what would you do if I weren't here? Because you want to know, because you are not going to be there in real life. You want to know how they would actually use this. Um, the thing that I often say is, I didn't program this, which is true. I did design it, but I didn't program it typically. Another thing is I, I need your help to find problems. Um, it can be very difficult for people to talk about what they dislike about things. Um, some are better at this than others, but in general, you get a lot of social desirability bias. So through some of these advanced methods, um, I'm just going to touch very briefly on what we're looking for when we're looking for a good system. Um, so there are four metrics for good systems, and these are what we're looking for when we are evaluating systems that we're designing. Functionality, usability, accessibility, and user experience. And functionality means it works. It does what it's supposed to do. Usability means I can use it means most or all people can use it even if they have limitations and user experience means I enjoy using it. This last one is a difficult one to sell I find sometimes for people in health services research but the bottom line is that if you need people to use something you need to care how it makes them feel. It's very good for uncovering problems with usability and user experience it can uncover issues with accessibility depending on who you recruit. It's not the best way to look at functionality. Functionality sh should be tested certainly before you get to user te testing. When in KT research, so much about behavior change and it requires human reactions to your intervention. And what that means is that what we are testing are people's cognitive and affective or emotional responses to elements of your design. And this can be much more difficult to observe than things like, you know, can people get through this, can people get through this site and buy the thing that they're here to buy? Because that's more of a navigation question. So recommendation, this is a, um, and this is a, a format that I've come up with with a, a project um, that I'm working on with colleagues in the U.S is a table with five columns where we talk about each design element, what we want it to convey, which is a useful design exercise anyway, and then test what people get from this, how to make them feel, and other things that you might want to keep for a publication later. And think of it sort of like 
hypothesis testing your design. So um, with this comment, the so use always right. Uh, this is a, a bit of you know this is a little bit in tension with some of the some of the underlying philosophies with KT. Um, but I'm going to give you a couple of quick logistics points. How many users? Hands. We don't have really good evidence on this. I will tell you that my, my research. I do three to eight people per cycle, and when I have clinicians, it could be as, as few as one per cycle. Um, I've given you a few tips on how to approach this kind of study with research ethics boards because they have a different way of seeing things. They want to see the materials, um, but your study materials are changing between cycles. So over the years, I've come up with a few tricks that seem to help. And there's always a question about how many cycles. I don't have really good evidence on this. There's some that's coming. In my research, I always plan for five to seven cycles um, at a minimum, and this means this this means the design process can take a long time, and that can have that conflict with funding constraints. User engagement. I'm just going to make the point that when we're looking at how user engagement fits in with this, typically user engagement in user-centered design is the moment at the level of involvement, but it can also hit partnership and shared leadership. So the actual takeaway that I want to leave everyone with is, is to be really clear, if you're going to do this, to think about whose goals are we assessing. And that's the logical takeaway is this concept of being early and failing well. Um, and to build systems that help users meet, goal, meet their goals, we need to listen to people, but we also need to use methods that don't require study participants to precisely articulate everything. So I have further resources there, and feel free to ask me any questions you may have. Great. Thanks very much, Holly, for that really intriguing talk. Um, I think rather than go through each site uh, like we've done normally in the past, I would maybe just ask uh, people who have burning questions. We have about five minutes. Uh, just to say uh, from which site you are, uh, who you are, and pose your question to Holly. I hear anybody, so maybe we'll go site to site and see if there's any quick questions. So Calgary. No. Anybody from Edmonton have a question? No question. Thanks. Um, how about Hamilton McMaster? Question. Thanks. Uh, is, is there a St. Peter's site at Hamilton uh, connected? Not uh, anybody at St. Mike's? I think anyone's got a question here. Thank you, though. Hi, yes, we have a question. This is uh, Justine. I just wanted to ask, um, Holly, thanks for the presentation. You made the distinction between seeing and asking, and I'm just curious, as I know much in this area, about the types of um, uh, outcomes, but it's probably not this, the kind of indicators you're looking for um, when you're watching people interact with technologies. What are the most popular variables and indicators that people look at? Um, so typically, more broadly in the field of human and computer, human computer interaction, what I'm looking for are, thing, are often things like um, how quickly can people complete a task, do people get hung up in different areas of, of navigation and so on. That's sort of the, those are the classic indicators. What I am often looking for in my, um, in my research is how much time do people spend looking at specific things? Because that's a good, um, it's a good proxy of what concerns them, what confuses them. Um, 
and they aren't always able to articulate that specifically. Typically, asking you get all the subjective, all the t all the usual subjective sub um, self report and stuff, as well as their opinions about. Uh, Okay, question. So anybody at Housie have a question? Hi there, it's Logan Lawrence from Dalhousie. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation, Holly. I was curious about um, non-digital applications for user-centered design. A lot of, uh, of your examples were around, you know, apps or site interfaces. So I was wondering if you'd give me an example of uh, how it might be used in, like, say, a non-technological way. So I think that's a great question, and and as I said, you know, because I'm coming at this from a from a tech field, that's where my research is. Um, I'm currently um, co-investigator on a project where we're using a very a, a design pro this design process to develop blitz that will be sent out to patients post um, post heart attack, post MI. So so you know the the same concepts can be used. But you're right that most of the tradition in this is in the, is in the tech area. Um, I think the idea of the cycles of design and the really rapid, um, you know, rapid feedback is much more broadly applicable. So the methods tend to be very focused on, very focused on tech, but the overall approach is more broadly applicable. Thanks. So. I know that our webinar, our seminar is about to come to an end, so um, I'll just I'll leave it to Megan and we'll ask Holly some questions here in Quebec City if there are any. Thanks. 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 Thank you, Matt, for moderating, and thank you so much, Holly, for the great presentation. Um, I didn't have any questions come in through the chat, so I guess we can, we can leave it right here. Uh, uh, so thanks very much, and thank you for, for Hubert for helping as well. And, um, yeah, I look forward to seeing some of you in Halifax in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>